Fritz, what is the Illuminati? Explain in brief, if you will, what is the Illuminati, who is the Illuminati, and what is their prime objective? The Illuminati are the powerful bloodlines that have controlled the globe, and they have quietly persisted throughout the centuries. And you can trace some of their genealogies. Some of their genealogies are hidden. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my Bloodlines of the Illuminati book is show some of the genealogies and show how some of these bloodlines go way back. So there, uh, some people call them uh, the powers that be, but they're not the entire um, structure that's controlling things. They're the string pullers, um, and they also have their own religion, which is Gnosticism, and they're generational. Um, so, if you're born, in, if if you're born into an Illuminati family, you may or may not actually become a member, um, and you may or may not become a hierarchy member. So. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, it, it's generational. And um, really, after working with people that had come, that were trying to come out of the Illuminati that I was trying to help uh, and getting to understand the rituals that they performed, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that these are generational satanic families. Right. What is the modus operandi of the Illuminati? How do they operate? How do they normally infiltrate an organization, an institution? How do they go about doing that? Well, you know, people that are coming into this whole subject uh, relatively new, let's say they, they were introduced to the whole subject six months ago or a year or maybe two years ago, they're thinking, when did the Illuminati take control? But the actual uh, reality of it all is they are the ones that have constructed our world system of systems. So our educational system, our pharmaceutical system, um, the, the medical uh, health industry, uh, all these different uh, th things like the market, you know, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, exchanges around the world, all these various systems were created by them. So it's not so much a, a, and the, the cons, it, it's, it's really not the concept that they have infiltrated and hijacked these. They created them. And one of the things I wanted to discuss today, which we had talked about discussing, was the apostasy in the churches. And uh, when we, getting back to your, this pertains to your question, you know, if you start looking at all these different religious groups, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the LDS Mormons, the Primitive Methodists, the Adventists, um, Moravians, and you just start going down a long list of, of denominations, Christian groups, you'll see that Freemasons, a lot of times Freemasons that connect back in to the Illuminati, created these organizations. Like uh, Joseph Smith Jr., who created the LDS Mormons, he was of this Illuminati bloodline, and all of the leadership, the they call them prophets, they're presidents of the LDS Church, have been of the same bloodline, and they all go back to this Illuminati bloodline. Charles Taze Russell, who started the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he was of the Russell Illuminati family. So, it is so the question that is not. When did the when did the Illuminati subvert the Mormons or the the or when did they infiltrate and subvert the Jehovah's Witnesses? The reality is 
is they were the ones that created these organizations. Right, yes. And the, the, the topic of this interview is the Illuminati infiltration into Christendom, we can say, more specifically into churches, uh, into Protestant churches. And that's why I was asking what, what for, for people who uh, aren't familiar with the Illuminati or how they operate, uh, it's important uh, that you said what you said because now they'll have a better idea of how they infiltrate churches and why. And that brings me to the to again to the the primary topic here. There's a movement happening. Uh, two two movements are happening simultaneously, and both of these movements movements are being influenced and be, actually have ha, were started by uh, the global elite, the Illuminati these ruling families, these ruling factions, and the two movements are ecumenism and the interfaith movement. Ecumenism is uh, basically an amalgamation of all the Christian denominations, including the Catholic Church, together. So it amalgamates, ecumenism seeks to amalgamate or to fuse all of the different denominations together under the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, it's it's really like all the Protestant little churches come, going home to the mother hen, the little Protestant chicks going home to the mother hen, which is the Catholic Church. There's there's a very strong ecumenism movement or ecumenical movement happening right now, and then there's a very strong interfaith movement happening. And the two kind of entwine. The interfaith movement is a movement that is seeking to amalgamate all the religions of the earth uh, under one banner. And uh, that's the ultimate goal. And I know you know, Fritz, that the Illuminati are seeking not only a one world uh, political structure, but also a one world religious structure. And uh, so we're, they're moving, they're, they're funding, um, and we, we'll get into this in a little bit. They're actually funding and have been funding for years certain movements within the Protestant churches uh moving towards a one ultimately a one world religion is that a is that an accurate assessment yes the illuminati have had on their agenda the creation of a one world religion jp morgan who became an illuminati member late in the uh, 1800s after he had become an illuminati member he uh, started supporting an ecumenical movement to unite all of the Christian churches. And under his tutelage, um, financed by him, they created the Federal Council of Churches of Christ. It was called the FCCC. And um, the leadership of the FCCC were Freemasons. And um, by the way, Charles Taze Russell, who had started the Jehovah's Witnesses, you may be a little bit surprised, but he was like one of the first people that started supporting uh, this ecumenical movement by uh, J.P. Morgan to unite the Christian churches. The strange thing of it was, as though he verbalized in his talks around the world, support for this, the Watchtower Society itself never uh, publicly joined the FCCC. The FCCC then, it, it transformed itself into the National Council of Churches. Notice that they dropped off the, the word Christ. And um, again, uh, the National Council of Churches its leadership were Freemasons, and Freemasonry uh, is like the glove. Uh, if, if the Illuminati is the hidden hand that's controlling things, Freemasonry's like the glove to it. And so, again, we see high-ranking Freemasons um, like G. Uh, Oxum Bromley, who was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was uh, one of the leaders of the FCC, NCC, and and then later the World Council of Churches. Um, so he was the first president of the World Council of Churches. So after we got the National Council of Churches, 
Then the next step was to create the World Council of Churches. And you see in, uh, I believe it was 1982, in Sweden, the World Council of Churches pledged themselves to support, actively support a one world government and a one world church. And uh, Billy Graham has been very active in the World Council of Churches. Now, when Billy Graham first got started, um, and he was asked about the World Council of Churches back in the early 50s, he made the comment that he felt like they probably were uh, selecting the Antichrist. But by the late 50s, he was actively participating in it. And in fact, uh, you know, I pulled out some stuff here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it there. But here's Billy Graham in uh, the New Delhi. This is the 1961 World Council of Churches meeting. And that's Billy Graham there at that meeting. And um, he became the leading uh, advocate around the world for ecumenicalism. Uh, he himself is a 33rd degree Freemason. And uh, this is, this is a, a book, The Clergy and the Craft, written by uh, Reverend Haggard, who's also a Freemason. And uh, in here, in his book uh, on, on Freemasonry, uh, he quotes Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham, and, and I, when I read this book, I noticed that everybody in here that he quotes is, are Freemasons, right? But the, the Masonic Lodges kept Billy Graham's uh, membership secret, although some Freemasons, not knowing who I was, have told me, gloated and bragged that Billy Graham was a Freemason. In fact, I talked with Jim Shaw, who's the highest ranking Freemason to defect f from Freemasonry. He is a 33rd degree Freemason, and he left, he, he, he gave his life to Christ and left Freemasonry. And I talked with him on a number of occasions. Billy Graham was at his 33rd degree initiation ceremony in Washington, D.C., and uh, although I don't have it here to, to show to you, but I mean, uh, I, can, I can just simply say what it says. The Scottish Rite magazine that I, I have boxes of, of Masonic literature and books and magazines. And in one of them, it talked about the 33rd degree initiation ceremony and how only 33rd degree Freemasons are allowed to attend. So the fact that Billy Graham was attending his initiation ceremony, his 33rd degree initiation ceremony shows that Billy Graham himself is a 33rd degree Freemason. And here in this book by this Freemason, they quote uh, Billy Graham. They say, Dr. Billy Graham said, uh, and he's talking about the Order of Demolays, which is the Masonic order for young people. He's saying, um, there are the young people upon which the hope of America's future rests and Demolays are part of this group. May God richly bless all Demolays as they continue their good work. So there's Billy Graham uh, uh, bragging or saying that God's work is going to be done by the Order of Demolay, which, uh, you know, is named after Jock Demolay, who was the head of the, um, the Knights Templars, which, you know, Jock Demolay was was killed on Friday the 13th. It was kind of interesting here in 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 Portland, they have a, a the Billy Graham people. This is the Billy Graham crusade here, you see. The Billy Graham crusade people, they gave out this this certificate for women and when is it redeemed? Friday the 13th. I just thought it was really coincidence that uh, you know, Jacques de Molay, who was killed on Friday the 13th, um, and then they, they give this, the Billy Graham crusade gives the certificate that's, that can be redeemed that day. Interesting. But anyway, uh, there's, there's three major, uh, uh, there, there's many more, but three major 
Christian clergymen come to my mind that are, are very powerful in America that are 33rd degree Freemasons. You have Norman Vincent Peale, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. You had Robert Schuller, who is a 33rd degree Freemason, and Billy Graham, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. And all of those men have promoted this ecumenicalism, especially Billy Graham. And he's, he, he's been very active in the World Council of Churches. Now, if we go back and, and look, who are the members, who are the leadership of the World Council of Churches? You, you see people that are, are diametrically opposed. They're apostates. They're, these are people that um, are Communist Party members, that are high-ranking Freemasons, socialists, you know, Illuminati members. And um, the, the convergence uh, needs to include the Catholic Church. So, you know, you'll notice that uh, Billy Graham is very, uh, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? He's, he's very active with the Catholic Church. You know, he got his honorary doctorate. Here's the Catholic Church um, bestowing this on him. And the uh, and, and and then this is a newspaper article here where the Archbishop endorses Billy Graham. And I know that uh, his crusade doesn't tell the truth because Billy Graham has been very active in supporting the Catholic Church. Like when he went to Poland and he did his crusade, if you came forward, you were sent to a Catholic church. And um, another time he went to uh, Poland, uh, he uh, spoke in Catholic churches, and he told them that they were already Christians. He didn't say that they needed Christ or salvation. He was saying, you, are, you already have Christ, you're already Christians. This is, this is what ecumenicalism is about is the merging of all these different churches. And and this is just, I came out with a list of 200 high-ranking Vatican officials who were Freemasons. I gave their secret initiation dates, their secret membership numbers, their uh, uh, secret Masonic names. There were two men that died to get that information. Anyway, I also went through on the the protestants don't look any better when it when when you talk about freemasonry and these are some pages from my be wise the serpents book and here you can see i go denomination by denomination and give ministers that are freemasons american baptist general baptist baptist missionary baptist national baptist northern baptist southern baptist you know southern baptist is the largest denomination within the Protestants, and 65% of their ministers are Freemasons. So here's some more of these lists of Freemasons, uh, ministers, Christian Church, Church of God, Church of Scotland, Congregational, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalian. Uh, when, it, when we talk about the Episcopalian Church, that's really just a, a heretic branch of the Catholic Church. You, the Church of England broke off of the Catholic Church. Part of the reason why was is the king wanted to be able to divorce his wife, and um, he was beheading several of them uh, because he he couldn't find a wife that would produce a sire, and uh, so he he wanted permission to divorce his wife. The Pope said no, so he deposed the Archbishop of Canterbury and put in his own uh, person, and that caused a split with the Catholic Church. There were also some other issues, but uh, that was the major issue. So when we talk about the Church of England, they also call that church the Anglican Church, but since the American Revolution, it wasn't very popular to refer to, uh, I'm going to the Church of England after our revolution. So they, they started calling it the Episcopalian Church, but the Episcopalian Church, the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, who's the head of it, 
has typically been a Freemason. And uh, so here we go, Methodist Episcopal, Evangelical, Friends, Jewish rabbis, Lutherans, Methodists. Uh, we just go down, you know, uh, Presbyterians, United Presbyterians, Reformed Church, uh, Salvation Army, Unitarian, United Brethren, uh, United Church of Christ, Universal. You, you, you go through Freemasonry has has members throughout Christendom. <laughs> throughout that, Christendom. that brings me to a question, Fritz. Um, I have a lot of questions from from all that information you just covered, but but I know that in the past I can't uh, reference the date, but I know that in the past or the time frame. The Vatican at least feigned to be at war with the Masons. In fact, uh, the Jesuits were the adversaries of the Masons for a time. But now I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but something had happened within the Vatican uh, some years back to where there was either some kind of a Masonic takeover or an Illuminati infiltration that changed all of that. What is the relationship? at this point in time, between the Vatican and the Illuminati slash Masons? Good question. What is the relationship between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry? You know, typically over the last few centuries, uh, people have been told that there's this huge war going on between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. Now, going back to an earlier question that you had asked, how does the Illuminati operate? Well, one of their major tactics is to use controlled conflict. It's called Hegelian dialectics. They'll, they'll create a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. So this whole thing between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church or going back even before that, we have the Knights Templars in the Catholic Church, is really a controlled conflict. Now, one of the things that I did in my Be Wise as Serpents book was I discussed how there were powerful families. You look at the Medicis, Visconti, Solve, they have provided popes. Now, they not, they not only have provided family members that became popes, but they have actually, these powerful families have controlled the Catholic Church from behind the scenes. Now, uh, the Jesuits got created, and when they were created, they were called the Order of the Illuminati, and Ignatius, as you probably know, or some of our, our uh, viewers or listeners know, uh, created the... Um, the the Jesuits, the Order of Jesus, and um, then in 1733, the Pope at that time decided, no, the, the Jesuits are out of control. They're trying to take over things. They've got an agenda that's not, not Catholic, and the, the Pope outlawed the Order of Jesuits. Well, how did the Jesuits survive? Well, this is a page taken from a book of mine that I have not actually published. It's an unpublished book of mine. But this is Frederick the Great here. The, the man over here on the other side is, is a Jesuit named Carroll who provided the land. He gave the land that Washington, D.C. is now on. But uh, the head of Freemasonry at that time was Frederick the Great, and he's the one that got the Scottish Rite introduced into America, and they started the, the Scottish Rite um, in uh, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina became the center of uh, the Scottish Rite at the time. Anyway, Frederick the Great was the one that saved the Jesuits. The head of Freemasonry saved the Jesuit order by giving them asylum from the Pope who had outlawed them. And so nothing's as it seems. We have a controlled conflict. When you start looking at things behind the surface, 
you start seeing that, that Freemasonry and the Catholic Church come together at the top, and the, the controlling thing between both of them is the Illuminati. The Illuminati send out instructions to the Pope, as well as the Protestantism, uh, through the United Grand Lodge in London. I know that I know that as a fact. They send out um, instructions to both factions, and so there are many ways that you can start seeing uh, these kind, of, uh, seeing the the reality behind the smoke screens. This is Masonic jewelry, their badges, and so forth. This is a a catalog where you can buy. If you're a Freemason, you can buy uh, your your badges and your rings and stuff. Here are your badges, your rings. Okay, now let's see. Coming up here, it says 32nd degree Scottish Rite, and it's got all your rings for the 32nd degree here in the catalog. But you go to the next page, it's the Knights of Columbus, the, 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 the Catholic uh fraternal organization you get your you go to the same place to get your badges and stuff whether you're in the the knights of columbus as a catholic uh and and actually when i started researching these organizations i discovered that on washington's birthday and washington was a freemason on washington's birthday in 1967 the heads of the knights of columbus and the heads of Freemasonry got together, the uh, the 33rd degree Scottish Rite. They got together, and they had a high level meeting. How can we collaborate and work together? So all this thing about the Catholic Church and Freemasonry uh, fighting this massive war. Sure, there's been a war, but it's been a controlled conflict, and. Uh, I have a lot of Masonic magazines, and you can go back. Uh, I I don't have them here to show, but I, I can quote them. And uh, this one Masonic magazine from 1919 talks about how Freemasonry is a world power and that they need to take their power as a world power and use it to control the world, to create a one-world government and a one-world religion. This is in... A, this is in the, the Scottish Rites magazine back then was called the New Age magazine. And, um, and so they talk about Freemasonry being a world power, but they say that the other world power is the Catholic Church and that they need to uh, over, overpower the Catholic Church. So it was at, at that time in 1919, there was this uh, controlled conflict between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry, but by the by 1967, you see the leadership of both groups getting together and collaborating. How can we work together on on um, a similar agenda? You know, <laughs> and then you look at my list of 200 leading uh, Vatican officials, and and that they're Freemasons. You know, so uh, so you may have. Uh, in the lower levels of Freemasonry and the lower levels of the Jesuit order and the different orders within the Catholic Church, you may have those factions, individuals involved in those factions who actually believe there is conflict between, for example, if you're a Mason, between your organization and the Knights of Columbus. And they probably allow that to, to occur. They probably foster some of that conflict. But at the top, what you're saying is at the top, it's amalgamated. It's it's the same team at the top of the pyramid. Right. And let's look at one item of their agenda. If you get into looking at what some of the Jesuit priests are advocating, they advocate what's called liberation theology. Okay, we discussed earlier about the World Council of Churches. Well, at the very same meeting in Sweden, where they talked about that they were going to advocate for a one world government, one world religion. They also said that they were going to support a liberation theology. 
And uh, I made a note to myself, I had because I knew I would, we were going to talk about these kind of subjects, I made a note to myself, the World Council of Churches, they gave $158,000 to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. They gave $740,000 to SWAPO, which was a communist uh, guerrilla organization in Africa. And then the ANC, which was a guerrilla organization in South Africa, which was fighting against apartheid back then. This we're talking about in the 1980s. They gave $362,000 to those guerrillas to help them in their guerrilla war. So they started funding, liber the World Council of Churches started funding liberation gr uh, theology guerrillas in Central America and in Africa that were fighting uh, wars, guerrilla wars, which, you know, that was like the precursor to uh, terrorist groups that we have today. And uh, and what what do you think the purpose was behind them funding these, these different uh, sectarian organizations? Well, it's interesting that you have both the Jesuits and the Freemasons uh, which were both be, uh, both active in the World Council of Churches, all three of these organizations, Freemasons, Jesuits, World Council of Churches, are funding liberation theology or libera uh, these guerrilla movements around the world. It, it goes back to another thing that is, is an Illuminati uh, saying, order out of chaos, ordo ob chaos. You'll see that. You'll see that uh, little slogan written in a lot of places. And um, in other words, going right back to controlled conflict, by having the, this chaos, they the, the controllers come in and work an agenda. It's, uh, it, it's the thesis, antithesis, and the synthesis. So to see how this worked is, you know, you have World War One, and out of World War One, which was a controlled conflict, you have the League of Nations. You have World War Two, which was a controlled conflict, and out of it, you have the United Nations. And then, the what had been originally planned, but now I think that they may have backed off and and changed their agenda some. But they had originally planned a third world war, which was centered in the Middle East, which would then bring in their, their new world order, world government on a visible uh, um, level. They already have world government, um, but they, to bring it in visibly where we ask them to bring it in is, is another thing. And so going back to um, J.P. Morgan, remember I talked about how he was Illuminati and he, he funded the FCCC, the Federal Council of, uh, of Churches of Christ. Well, the Federal Council of Churches of Christ was calling for a League of Nations before World War I, before. And then because World War I took place, then people said, well, we definitely need this League of Nations. So you can see them bringing in their agenda. Now, going back to the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches and how they integrate in with the Illuminati, John Foster Dulles, whose brother Alan Dulles was head of the, he was, he was a prominent in the OSS, as well as then the the uh, CIA, which was created f after the OSS was terminated, the it, it picked up again as the CIA. And Alan Dulles was the DCI, the head of of it. And his brother John Foster Dulles was the secretary of the FCCC, and he was very important also in. In the National Council of Churches, and also in the World Council of Churches. So where I'm going with this is, 
is the CIA and the Illuminati were very active in all of those those ecumenical organizations. And how does this how does this affect us on the local level? Well, you uh, I'll give you an example. You know, let's say you have this little uh, Church of Christ out here, and this little Church of Christ says, we are the true believers because we believe that you're saved by baptism, and we don't believe in musical instruments. And all these other churches believe in musical instruments, that, uh, you know, we don't believe in the Catholic Church, and you're saved by your your water baptism. Okay, well, uh, people that aren't into that would say, well, that's really cultish, you know. But the thing of it is, is when you have someone like the Billy Graham come here, every church in southern Washington and northern Oregon supported the Billy Graham crusade, even churches of Christ like that. And here they are supporting basically an ecumenical movement because the Catholic Church was very active in the Billy Graham crusade here in Portland. Now, because I was trying to expose the Billy Graham crusade and the ecumenicalism of it, uh, I and someone else, we confronted the Billy Graham crusade staff. They said, you're going to send, we said, you are going to send people to Catholic churches that come forward in your crusade here in Portland. And they they lied right to our face. We got it on tape recorder. We, we taped it. They said, no, we will not send people forward, or we will not send people to Catholic churches that come forward at the crusade, right? That's what they told us. We taped it. The very next day, we were listening to the Catholic radio station here in Portland, and the archbishop was on radio talking to the Catholic listeners, and he said, Billy Graham has confirmed personally with me that anybody who goes forward that's got a Catholic background is going to be sent, uh, referred to Catholic churches. So right there, the very next day, we heard proof that the Billy Graham crusade people had lied to us. But what's interesting is, is here all of these little denominations that would have nothing to do with the Catholic Church are, are you know, joining it and, and all other kinds of churches. Like I say, there was, only, there was only one church in all of Southern Washington and, and uh, Northern, Port, uh, Northern Oregon that didn't participate in the Billy Graham, Graham Crusade, only one church. We're, we're, our religion or our faith is lame. Where our religion or our faith is lame. Where our religion or our faith is lame.